And I'm glad all y'all are here this morning, all right? Thanks for being here. Good morning. It is good to see you out. Thanks for using New Hope Air Conditioning today, all right? Uh, we're very happy that air conditioning works, all right? The scripture says all good things come from above. And I'm grateful for air conditioning, all right? However it comes, we're glad to have it. Thank you for being with us today. Uh, if you are a guest at New Hope, you honor us by your presence today. In the pews, there are some communication cards. I would love for you to fill one out, put it in the offering. We promise not to beat on your door, bother you on the phone, but through the mail, we'll give you information that tells you about the church, about the staff, about the services and ministries that we have, and it might be helpful for you in making a decision whether you ever want to come back again. So we'd love to get that information in your hands. Uh, Milo, are you still back there, or did you sneak out already? Milo, okay, I just want to bring him out. I, I, we need to show Milo some love, all right? Uh, as you know, most of you who know, wait, 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 wait. i got to tell you why you need to love him, all right? Because um, there are probably some reasons not to. Lisa, could you share us a few of those? No. Um, as you know, we're in the midst of doing some remodel, all right? And it's been the stage the last two weekends, all right? Uh, you see the wood floor on, all right? Not quite finished. That blue tape will not be there permanently. That was not part of the design. But anyway, everything is in a mess sound-wise here. Everything is out of the room. It's in another building. He's had to move it back and forth. Uh, currently, part of what's being done is running a whole new snake from the front to the sound booth in the back. So everything was cut. All right? So we don't have a sound system back there this week. So we had to bring a portable system in, hook it all up here. Uh, he did started about 4 o'clock, got home about 9 o'clock last night. So... He's doing a lot of extra work to make Sunday mornings happen. So let's show Milo some love, New Hope love, all right? We probably have for sure one more Sunday that things will be a little out of whack, maybe two, all right? Uh, but anyway, the stage is getting close to being ready. The back wall will be worked on next week. Uh, and then we've got a few more decisions to make about what might be next. But uh, thank you for your support. Thank you for putting up with some of the inconvenience. But man, aren't those bathrooms nice. All right, much, much nicer. So we're grateful. Uh, let me highlight a few um, uh, announcements that we need to hit and then a couple of prayer requests that are not in your bulletin, and then we'll get reengaged in our worship here this morning. Uh, if you brought a bicycle today for Prison Fellowship, hopefully uh, you saw Fred Mendren out there, all right, has a uh, truck and a trailer, and uh, you left it off with him, and if you forgot to bring it, uh, call him, and you can probably make arrangements to deliver it, but you need to call him before you do that, all right? Uh, this coming Tuesday is uh, the second Tuesday of the month. That is our seniors luncheon around here. So if you are 55 or older, you qualify, all right? I'm putting pressure now on though those of you who are 65, 55, many of you are still working, 65, I don't want you to think I'm not old enough to come. You are old enough to come, and here's what I want to encourage you, you need to come for the sake of the 80 plus year olds, okay? They started coming when they were in their 60s, they are now in their 80s, and they need a youth movement, all right? They need some of those of you who are younger. See, they used to bring lots of stuff for the potluck lunch. They can't bring as much as they once were able to, all right? It's just not possible for them. So uh, instead of not admitting that you are in that stage of life, because denial doesn't change the fact. You are there. We are there, all right? So it would be really great to have some of you others come and join. Check it out and bring some, some, some uh, new encouragement to those who are already there. Uh, but this particular Tuesday happens to also fall exactly on Pop's birthday. So Deb will turn 92 during the senior luncheon, all right? Uh, Janice has ordered a birthday cake to be there, and uh, the fire marshal did tell us that we cannot put 92 candles on the cake, all right? Uh, but anyway, uh, we'll hope you come and enjoy the luncheon this coming Tuesday. We did have a couple of special things in the last service. I don't always get into birthdays and anniversaries, but sometimes uh, they stand out. And uh, Jack Kilner, who he and his wife are over teaching third and fourth grade right now, today is Jack's 80th birthday. Now, did you hear what I said he was doing right now? He and his wife are teaching our third and fourth grade Sunday school class. Those kids love them. 
And I asked Jack today, I said, how does it make you feel at 80 teaching third and fourth graders? He said, Tim, they make me feel like I'm 50. (laughs) So some of you who are feeling a bit long in the tooth right now, volunteer to teach Sunday school. It'll be a youth movement for you, all right? But anyway, if you see Jack after service, tell him happy 80th birthday. And then a couple also in our last service, Phil and Hazel Wright, two of our shortest people in the church, all right? Uh, Tomorrow is their 71st wedding anniversary. 71, that is just awesome. So uh, we, we, we thought those were, were worthy of mention today, all right? Um, there is going to be a family barbecue and slip and slide, water slide is going to be here on July 19th. Not this Wednesday, but a week from this coming Wednesday. So it'll uh, be a great night to get together with our younger families around, uh, around a barbecue and kids, uh, kids cooling off. And I understand adults can go down the slip and slide, all right? So you might want to check that out. All right, the Harvest of Blessing announcement that's in your bulletin, there is a correction. There is a change. We have had to change the date, so I want you to make note of that. It's still months away, but last week we had first announced it, and we had it as November the 3rd. It's being backed up to Sunday evening, October the 29th, all right, October the 29th. Um, They did a great job checking all the schedules, all right, Um, except mine. And I was already committed to uh, being an MC and an auctioneer for Central Valley Veterans, all right, event. One of their big fundraisers I've done up the last three years. So you either had to have an anniversary celebration without me, and I wouldn't have been happy. (laughs) Or we had to find a date to change it to. And so we were able to change it to Sunday evening, October 29th, and you told me 6 o'clock? 5.30 5.30 or 6, we will keep you posted on what the time is on that particular day. Um, I've got a sign-up sheet to go around. Uh, this is the first time it's been around. This is something new that uh, our associate pastor, Mark Addis, is wanting to get off the ground. Uh, and it's called a Sunday morning prayer team. And what this is all about is, is finding volunteers who would be available right before and right after each of our services in a designated location, which will probably be the room adjacent to the nursery, uh, where if we have a few people in there before and after, if someone has a special need and they want to pray with someone, uh, they have a place to go. It's not easy for us in the sanctuary. We have a very quick turnaround between services. And so being able to come forward and to have prayer with somebody is sometimes difficult or you feel awkward because of all the noise. So we're going to be having a room that would be available 15 minutes before and 15 minutes uh, after each of our worship services. And so if there was something that you felt you would love to pray with somebody about, there would be folks in the room uh, that would be able to pray with you and with others. Uh, By putting your name and contact information on here, you are not signing a contract. All you're doing is saying, I'm interested, and Mark will follow up with you, give you more explanation, and then at that point, you can make some decisions, all right? And we're looking at this probably uh, uh, once September gets here, all right? So he's just trying to get, uh, get a list of names that he can work with between, uh, between now and then. Um, I'm going to talk about something that's sort of mechanical around the church for just a moment. It's, it's, it's part of how we do things. And uh, this kind of stuff, rarely do I talk about on a Sunday morning service, but this is when the challenges have been popping up, so I want to address it. Um, There is a procedure for the way in which we do offerings here. Part of it is what's uh, simply good procedures from a business perspective. Part of it is we are legislated by uh, law, by being a a 401c3. Uh, And part of it is what... our our church board over the years has determined is as good policy and practice. Um, We must, at the end of every year, actually it's the beginning of the following year, we must send out to every contributor of our church a letter stating what they they donated to the church that previous year. Uh, You you should have gotten one this week, actually. We kind of do a test run in the middle of the year. That way, if there's an error or a mistake, you can let the office know they can fix it before time crunch in January. Uh, and sometimes if you did not get one but you've been a contributor, it's one of two things. Either you've been doing cash only and not putting your name and information on the envelope or cash only directly in the bag, or we have incorrect address for you. So either one of those things we would like to correct uh, if those are the issues for you not getting a letter. 
The other thing is, and this is primarily for folks who put cash in an envelope. If you put cash, a check in an envelope is fine. Uh, a check really doesn't need to go in an envelope unless you're giving some direction on the envelope. Uh, but cash in an envelope without a name, it just goes in cash. We have no idea. Uh, actually, I tried to get them to put it all under my name. But they didn't go for that, all right? So uh, cash, cash in an envelope with no name doesn't get credit anywhere except in the cash column. Here's the issue. What some people are doing is they just put their last name and cash in an envelope. We have multiple families with the same last name in our church. We've got at least seven or eight. Uh, the counters, who happen to be two former IRS agents, and an accountant, okay? <laughs> who better to count your money, all right? They do this in a, a locked room, and uh, there's accountability back and forth. They are the ones, one of them is one who enters that information into the computer, all right, under your name or the name of the person on there. When it's just a last name, they have no idea what to do with it. If there's not an address, they, they, they can't find out who the person is that way. So when you do cash, we want to make sure you get appropriate credit for it. We need a bit more information. So we need a full name. And if we've never had your address, it's helpful to put your full name and your address, and there's a sample in here. All right? Clear as mud? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, you'll make those guys on Monday mornings much, much happier. All right? I hope you take the opportunity to read about the Hedas and the Blanket Chips, our volunteers, all right, for the week. Uh, both long, long time volunteers here at our church, and uh, we have been so blessed to have both of those couples as part of our church family. Uh, do be praying for Sam. He's been battling kidney stones for over about 10 days now, and he still has them, all right? So please be praying for him of that. Uh, oh, there he is. Yeah, you probably didn't recognize him because he got his hair cut, all right? Every one of them, all right? Every one of them cut short, uh, but he's looking good over there. Um, uh, please take note of those who are in your bulletin to be praying for. Uh, one specific I want to point out is uh, the Wells family, Thomas Wells. Um, Less than two weeks ago, I did a service for his mom, a memorial service for his mom. This coming Saturday, I will be doing a memorial service for his wife. So this has been a very challenging month for Thomas, all right? So would appreciate you remembering to pray, uh, pray for him if you would. Uh, at this time, I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward if they would come and wait on us today as we have our morning tithes and offering. Would you join with me as we pray? Our Father in heaven, I want to thank you for the life that you share with us. And Father, my heart's desire is that all of us have bigger hearts of gratitude towards you. And that that gratitude grows because we see your handiwork in our life. I know that uh, often I don't always give you credit for the things that uh, you are responsible for. And sometimes I blame you for things that I'm responsible for. But Father, the Scripture says every good and perfect gift comes from above. And so many times in our life we say, wow, I just had this weirdest thing happen to me this week. Or we say, wow, I, I, a coincidence of coincidences. Or wow, I was really lucky. When in reality, we were blessed. Blessed because of your activity and your care for us. And so Father, I pray that we will have uh, eyes that will be wide open to see your activity and that we will have hearts that appreciate your love and compassion for us. Father, I trust you with the needs that, that each of us have brought today as we've come from our, our various homes and different circumstances. You know what the burdens are that we carry and that we need to leave at your feet. You know the hurts that we, uh, we've allowed to make us bitter. You know the rejection that we have, have faced that's caused us to be fearful. And so, Father, I trust you will give all of these things to you. Lord, thank you for, um, thank you for your desire to, to be with us today, not only in us, but to be active in our worship today. Thank you for what you're doing in Tim's life as he leads us in worship today, Lord, and takes us to a place where we, we recognize it should be nothing but you in our thoughts at this moment. Father, for the privilege of showing our gratitude to your generosity in our lives, we, we give to you today with joy-filled hearts, our tithes and our offerings, thanking you in advance for your abundant sufficiency in our lives. We trust you for all this and so much more. In the incredible name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.
I invite you to find the little book of Habakkuk. If uh, you're new to New Hope or you've been gone for a couple of weeks, we've started a six to eight week series for the summer out of a little book in the Old Testament called Habakkuk. I've had a half a dozen folks this week either call or come by the office and say, Tim, how do you pronounce that guy's name? So uh, we're, we're going to rehearse it together today, all right? Habakkuk. 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 All right. Some would say, I've, I've been to some places, they say Habakkuk, okay? I don't want to be called a kook. I don't think he would either. So uh, I prefer the pronunciation of Habakkuk, all right? However you say it, it's found between Nahum and Zephaniah. If that didn't help you any, it's to the right of Psalms and to the left of Matthew, all right? It's only three chapters long, 56 verses, three pages in your Bible. Uh, if you were here last week in the bulletin, there was a bookmark. Hopefully you put it there, all right? Uh, how many of you did your, your suggested homework assignment this week? Good, all right, right, right. Oh, oh, good. Today, this side did better than this side, all right? So I don't know if the people moved, all right, from last week to this week, but uh, just asking you each week to read the three chapters probably doesn't take more than five to seven minutes. Uh, there's no questions assigned necessarily to you. I think this week I did ask, as you read it, think about, uh, is there anything in here that speaks to me? Is there something, one verse, one thought that came out that really spoke to me this week? I'm going to ask you, read it again this coming week, all right? And uh, maybe what's, uh, what's one question that's been created in your mind since you've been reading the book of Habakkuk? What is a question that may come to mind? And I may give you a chance next week to pop off what some of those questions might be, and we'll see if we can determine a few of the answers. We're going to be looking at chapter 2, just the first three verses this morning, all right? So Habakkuk chapter 2, the first three verses. Uh, Habakkuk is unlike any other prophetic book. We've made reference to this the last two weeks as well. Uh, it is one of the 17 books of the prophets in the Old Testament. There are five major prophets. There are 12 minor prophets. The difference between major and minor is size of the book, all right? Size of the book. Uh, it is, uh, it's a short one, so it's a minor prophet, but it doesn't mean that it is less important than any of the others. What is most unique about the book of Habakkuk is all it is from verse 1 to the last verse of chapter 3, it is a recording of a conversation between Habakkuk and God. It's a sample of what prayer is. Listening, talking, talking, and listening. That's what prayer is supposed to be. And Habakkuk gives us an example of it from beginning to end. Um, this book was written about 600 B.C., all right? That's, uh, that's more than 2,000 years ago. It's getting closer to 3,000 years ago, all right? So this book was written a long, long time ago, and yet the period of time in which it was written, the nation of Judah was corrupt. There was an abundance of violence. Promiscurity had gone rampant. There was corruption and injustice in high places. There was a lot of people who were ignoring God, Sounds rather contemporary, doesn't it? Sounds a lot like the 21st century. And so I think it's of great value for us uh, to kind of look at the book of Habakkuk at the time in which we live. You see, there were a lot of bad people doing a lot of bad things. And there were a lot of good people who weren't doing very good things. They weren't engaged in making a difference. And when Habakkuk recognized and began to struggle with the terrible moral decline of the nation of Judah that he was called to minister to, he began to pray to God to do something. Isn't that how you and I often pray? We face struggles. We have uncertain times. We're scared. And we often pray, God, do something. When in reality, God may have been doing something all along. We just didn't like what he was doing. Last week, as we looked at chapter 1, we made three observations from Habakkuk's prayer. Number one, we saw that Habakkuk was dissatisfied with unanswered prayer. Let me rephrase that. 
from Habakkuk's perspective, he thought all of his previous prayers had gone unanswered. In his prayer with God that's recorded in Habakkuk chapter 1, let me pause just for a moment. Um, I'm a bit more restricted to the podium. I like to move. I I don't think as well when I stand still. Uh, (laughs) uh, But this mic does not work for the speakers. So that's why I'm double mic today. This is for recording. This is so y'all can hear me. Because y'all probably couldn't hear me if I took that away, could you? Now you hear me just fine. Yeah, oops. Now it just got like me, shorter. Uh, All right. um, One of the things about Habakkuk that I, I love is this is not a pretty prayer. We, we, we go to the New Testament and we read the model prayer of Jesus. That's a pretty prayer. Habakkuk is not. And I think that's one of the reasons I appreciate and really like the book of Habakkuk. This is a messy prayer. This is an ugly prayer. This is a, a prayer where there is a lot of doubt, a lot of confusion. Have you ever prayed with doubt and confusion? I, I would imagine you have. I have. Uh, I've, I've prayed mad. Sometimes I've been mad at you. Sometimes I've been mad at God. And you could say the same thing. You've been mad at me. You've been mad at God. Tell God he takes it better than I do. Um, but, but, but we've all prayed mad, angry. And, and, and in this prayer, it comes out. The indictments that Habakkuk makes against God in his prayer in chapter 1 is that to him, to Habakkuk, in the situation he was in, God seemed to be indifferent, God seemed to be inactive, God seemed to be inconsistent. The the, the other thing that that, that troubled Habakkuk in this opening prayer is that he could not understand why God had allowed uncontrolled perversity to exist within the people of Judah. Judah. And the third thing that he wasn't happy with is the unexpected answer that God gave to him. You see, often we go to God with preconceived notions of how God should answer our prayers, don't we? Okay? God, just make my spouse sweeter. I have never prayed that prayer. Just (laughs) let me clarify that. Okay? Okay. but we often do. We, 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 have, we have expectations of how we think God ought to answer this prayer. And sometimes what appears to be unanswered prayer happens to simply be a different answer to the prayer. It's not what we wanted, but it's the way God is choosing to work in that situation. Um, let's jump in at chapter 2 where this becomes uh, an ongoing conversation Uh, It's going to start out with Habakkuk talking, and then God's going to respond. And this is a back-and-forth response. What real prayer is, is a conversation. Chapter 2, verse 1, let's read 1, 2, and 3. I will stand at my watch, and I will station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what he will say to me and what answer I am to give to this complaint. Then the Lord replied, Write down the revelation, make it plain on tablets, so that a herald may run with it. For the revelation awaits an appointed time, it speaks of the end, and it will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it, it will certainly come, and it will not delay. I may not get to it, so I want to point out just an interesting context of words in that last phrase. It will linger, but it will not delay. Isn't that interesting? You see, it's going to be right on time. You and I, they may think God is slow. God says it'll show up in time. You may need to linger. That's kind of an expression of our impatience. You may need to linger, but I am always on time. Um. This is really all about not only talking to God, but listening to God and hearing what he really says, not what we expect him to say. It was President Franklin Delano Roosevelt who got tired of that presidential smile and saying all the presidential things that he would say at White House receptions. 
So one evening, he decided to find out whether anybody was listening to what he was saying when he came through the line shaking their hands. And as each person that particular evening came through and shook hands with him, he said the same thing to every one of them. Big smile on his face, he would say, I murdered my grandmother this morning. <laughs> and people would automatically respond to him, well, how lovely. That was nice. Did it go well? He was amazed. They didn't pay any attention. Nobody listened to what he was saying except one foreign diplomat. When the president said, I murdered my grandmother this morning, the diplomat responded softly into his ear, I'm sure she had it coming to her. <laughs> you see, the problem today is not that God is not speaking, but rather we are not paying attention to what he says. It's not the Lord who isn't speaking. It quite frequently is us who are not hearing. I, I think in these couple of verses, Habakkuk gives us four steps of guidance, in receive, four steps of receiving guidance from the Lord. Let me cover those four steps very quickly, and then I'll talk about each one of them. Here's what they are, all right? The, f- the first step in this process is we've got to withdraw from stuff. Second of all, we have got to wait quietly and patiently. The third step is we need to watch and listen for God's direction. And fourth, we need to write it down so we don't forget. We need to write it down so we don't forget. So let's back up and begin to look at those four things. First of all, we've got to withdraw from stuff. Notice in verse 1, he says, I will stand at my watch. The uh, New Living Translation says, I will climb up to my watchtower and station myself on the ramparts. In other words, you and I need to find quiet places with God. We need to get to a place where the reality of the last song that we just sang together in worship is true for us. Nothing in this world matters. It's all about you. I think, I genuinely think that the vast majority of us in the room right now, as we were singing that worship song this morning, I think we had moments to where our full attention was undivided on God. I I believe that. But here's the question. From last Sunday's morning worship to this Sunday's morning worship, was there a minute in your life that it was all about him and nothing else mattered? Were there moments in your life you got away from the stuff, all the stuff of your life, and it was all about him? Sometimes it takes being alone to realize we're never alone. There's many examples of this in the life of Jesus. One, let me just highlight, it's found in Luke chapter 5, verse 15. The scripture says, Yet the news about Christ spread all the more. The crowds came to hear him and to be healed by him. And verse 16 says, But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. It doesn't say Jesus was lonely. It says Jesus went to lonely places and there he prayed. Pastor and author John Ortberg said, We are rarely alone, but we are often lonely. Jesus was often alone, but never lonely. Paul Tillich, an author and philosopher and and preacher of another generation, said, Loneliness expresses the pain of being alone, and solitude expresses the glory of being alone. Let me get to a more contemporary theologian, someone that most of you know, uh, uh, Jennifer Lopez. (laughs) You all familiar with her? She said, the thing I'm most afraid of is being alone, which I think a lot of performers are. It's why we seek the limelight, so that we're not alone, but we're adored. We're loved, so people want to be around us. The fear of being alone drives my life. It was a moment of honesty for her. 
You see, Jesus made this habit of withdrawing to the hills, to lonely places, to the wilderness, to a high mountain, to the Garden of Gethsemane. He went to these places alone before he chose his disciples. He went to these places alone after he had heard about John the Baptist, his cousin, being beheaded. He went to one of these places after he had shared in the feeding of the 5,000. He went there after healing a leper. He went there to be transfigured. And, of course, he went there to prepare for the moment of passion on the cross. Richard Foster, an author out of the early 80s, said, The seeking out of solitary places was a regular practice for Jesus, and so it should be for us. The question I'm asking is not when is the last time that you went to the mountains or when is the last time you went to the beach or when is the last time you went to the desert. What I'm really asking and what I believe the Lord is asking is when is the last time you were alone. Jesus said it this way in the New Testament in the Gospels. He said, find a closet. Find a closet. And get away from the stuff. That's what Habakkuk is discovering in this convoluted conversation he's having with God. He said, I need, I need to go stand at the watch. I need to go to where I can pay attention to what is really going on. Early African converts to Christianity were very earnest and regular in their private devotions. In this one particular village, it was reported that every one of the village Christians had a a separate spot out in the bush away from their village where they could pour out privately their hearts to God and they could hear from Him. Over time, their regularity going to these private places had worn a path to each of their spots of prayer. As a result, if one of the believers began to get negligent in their personal private prayer life, it was soon apparent to others. They would remind the one who had become negligent with this statement, Brother, the grass is growing on your path. How much grass is on your path? How much time are you spending away from all the stuff? The the second step in hearing from God Habakkuk lays out for us, is to wait quietly and patiently. Again in verse 1 and in the last phrase of verse 3. Station myself at the ramparts. I will stand at my watch. I will station myself at the ramparts. In other words, wait patiently and quietly. Take time to be still. The word for um, I will stand at my watch That is the very same word that is used in the book of Exodus, chapter 14, verse 13, when Moses says to the children of Israel, be still and see the salvation of the Lord. Just to put that in context, uh, Moses had just just heard from Pharaoh, all right, a few days before, okay, ten plagues, that's enough. I will let your people go. Get them out of Egypt. Take them back to wherever you want to take them. And so Moses had led Israel to the, to the banks of the Red Sea. And all of a sudden, all the Israelites start complaining and bellyaching to Moses. Moses, the Red Sea's in front of us. Pharaoh's changed his mind. He's sending an army. They're going to destroy us. We told you let us stay slaves. What are you bringing us out here for? To bury us? Moses' response was, be still. In other words, stop your human effort. Stop your human frustration. Stop your human complaining. Be still and watch what God is going to do. Habakkuk said, I need to get to the watch where I can see what God is going to do. Too many people, this is a quote of Nicholas Sparks, Most of you have probably read some of his books. Um, i got to be honest, Shelley dragged me into the living room one time to watch The Notebook. I thought, oh, another chick flick. (laughs) i got to tell you, I've watched it five times. What really lured me in there was the the leading actor. Yeah, James Garner, one of my favorites. All right. I like him better as Maverick, but it was really good. (laughs) 
It was really, really good. And I, I, I've, cr- I've seen it five times. I've cried all five times. I hate to admit that, but I have. It's one of those movies. Nicholas Sparks wrote, Too many people seem to believe that silence was a void that needed to be filled, even if nothing important was said. Wow, how right he is. What Habakkuk is telling us here is it's not to be us and our music. It's not to be us and the TV. It is not to be us and our radio. It's to be us and God. Shut it off. Get quiet. The ramparts, most of us probably have no idea what a rampart is. How many of you have ever stood at a rampart? Probably if you were in the military and you were on guard duty, that would have been your rampart, all right? Uh, As a watchman goes to a high place to see all around and discern what is coming at him, so the prophet places himself above the events of the world in some secluded high place in readiness to hear the voice and direction of God and sees the meaning of the coming event. If you want to study more about uh, a watchman on a tower, go read the book of Isaiah chapter 21. Sometimes I'm afraid the reason that we can't hear is because we can't stop. We can't slow down long enough to hear God's voice over all the noise of the world. Before refrigerators, let me just ask, that, that, that is before me, I, I, I I always had a refrigerator in the house I grew up in. We never had an ice box. Though I had my grandfather's cousins, they had an ice box in Oklahoma. I'd, it's where you bring ice in, and that's what keeps it cold. It's not plugged into anything. But, but any of you alive today who you remember what it was like to have um, um, an ice house? Okay, there's a couple of you. All right. You're not old enough. Oh, you had an ice route. Okay, all right, all right. Well, here's the deal about an ice house. It had very thick walls. It didn't have a window. It had a tightly fitted door. And in winter, when streams and lakes were frozen, large blocks of ice were cut out, hauled to the ice house, covered with sawdust to make it last longer. Often the ice would last well into the summer. One man lost a valuable watch while working in the ice house. He searched for it, carefully raking through all the sawdust, didn't find it. He got some of his friends to help him look. All their efforts proved futile. There was a small seven-year-old boy who heard about the fruitless search, and during lunchtime, he slipped into the ice house, and within just a matter of a couple of minutes, he emerged with the lost watch. Amazed, the men asked him, how did you find it? And the boy replied, simple, I closed the door. I laid down in the sawdust, and I kept very still, and before long, I heard it, tick, 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 I heard it. Often the question is not whether as God is speaking, but whether we are being still enough and quiet enough to hear and remember. Do you remember the old um, Heinz ketchup commercial? Good things come. To those who wait. Good things come to those who wait. Number three, watch and listen for God's direction. Let God give us a vision of what he wants to accomplish. Uh, The latter part of verse one, I will look to see what he will say to me and what answer I am to give to this complaint. In other words, I'll hear from God before I give an answer. I'm not going to answer first and then ask God to back up my answer. I'm going to hear first, and then I'm going to repeat what it is that God has to say. There are two ways that God speaks to us. Number one, and I believe the primary one, is God speaks to us out of the Bible. The guy with the last name Unknown said, If you want to hear God speak, read his book. If you want to hear him speak audibly, read it out loud. I love that. Absolutely right. 90% of the time, when we feel like we can't hear God speak to us, it's because we are not deep enough into God's Word to let it influence our thinking. Get the Bible. Read it. Not to just cover the material. Read it to get to know the author. Read it when you don't feel like you need guidance. For when you do, you'll receive guidance from the Lord. The second way is through the Holy Spirit's voice in our life. And this is probably the hardest part to explain. It's certainly the hardest part to teach and preach about because I can't really tell you how it happens. 
The Bible is filled, though, of God revealing himself to people in, in a huge variety of ways. Um, in Genesis chapter 5, God revealed himself to Enoch when he was just walking in the garden in the cool of the evening. In Exodus chapter 3, God revealed himself to Moses from a bush that Moses had seen hundreds of times before, but it didn't get his attention until it was burning and didn't burn up. God spoke to Balaam, this is the most interesting way, Balaam in Numbers chapter 22, if you've never read it, I encourage you, go home after church, read Numbers chapter 22. The, 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 the nuts and bolts of the story is Balaam was going in a direction God didn't want him to go in, and he was riding his donkey, okay? And three times an angel of the Lord appeared in the middle of the road, and Balaam didn't see him. Talk about spiritually blind, that was Balaam. The donkey saw it all three times, and the donkey stopped all three times, and Balaam beat the donkey all three times. Finally, the third time, God said, okay, enough with the angel, and he had the donkey talk to Balaam. <laughs> it's pretty sad when your mule is more spiritually sensitive than you are. In that case, he was. And then Elijah in 1 Kings 19, Elijah had been running from God. He was directionless. He went to the top of a mountain alone. And a storm came, and the voice of God could not be heard in the rain. And lightning and thunder and fire blew by his cave, and God was not found there. Elijah said, a still, small voice spoke to me. He couldn't hear it in the rainstorm, and he couldn't hear it in the fire. But when everything else got quiet, Elijah heard the voice of God. The Holy Spirit always will speak to your heart in agreement with the Bible. He wrote it. If you feel like God is telling you to do something immoral, to disobey the Scriptures, to dishonor your parents, to dishonor your family, I got news for you. God didn't tell you that. He will talk to you in consistency with the Scripture. It's why you must know what's in there. And last of all, he says, let's write this down. Record what you receive from God so you can share it with others, so you can pass it on. Habakkuk 2.2, the Lord replied, write down the revelation, make it plain, so that a herald can run with it. I think writing things down might be the most lost form of self-expression. Now, I'm not a journaling person. I'm not talking about writing down all of your thoughts and emotions of today. Okay? If you do, burn it in the morning. Okay? If you're writing down thoughts and emotions, you need to burn it at least every 30 days. And if you die in between that, leave directions for your best friend to burn it without showing it to anybody. All right? I can't tell you. I'm, I'm, I'm serious about it. I'm not kidding on this one. All right? I can't tell you problems that, that journals left have created in families when family members went back and read what somebody journaled about their feelings and emotions. What I'm talking about here is journaling what God is saying. Okay? Write it down. Lessons that you've learned from, from the still small voice as he speaks to you. Write it down. Some of the best messages have come right in the middle of prayer. God has just spoken very boldly. The power of writing things down helps our memory. I've learned that the shortest pencil is better than the longest memory. Did you hand me my cell phone right there? I, didn't, I should have brought it up with me. I'm, 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 he, here's what's better than a pencil. Because we never leave home without them. Sometimes leave the pew without them, but we never leave home without them. But as I was reading Habakkuk, writing it down, I thought, wow. I've done that some. I probably haven't done it enough. And, and there's a little section, most of you have it on your, on your phone, it's, it says notes. I started doing this when my mom was in the hospital for 41 days. And often it was 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, midnight, the room was dark, she was sleeping, and I just began to write. I don't want to share too many, but here's one uh, at the beginning of 2016. I started keeping a journal, I think I was doing this for 14 days what God was trying to teach me each day. 
one day I wrote this. Today I sense God speaking to me very differently at a funeral. Things were coming out of my mouth I had not prepared to say. I prayed in early hours, and though I was physically tired, at the end of that service I felt spiritually renewed. God says he'll renew us day by day. The next day, I wrote for the last couple of days, I battled fear regarding my heart. Today, Psalm 5 was very helpful. I've rarely battled anxiety in my life, but it seems to come from every side right now. Getting things ready at work. Bo, who had just been born, and I was getting ready to leave to see him the next day in Tennessee. I was concerned about Pops' health at the moment. My own heart, Africa coming up in a few weeks, preaching, I want to finish strong. I hate journaling. It's what I wrote. One more. An- another night where sleep does not come, third one in a row. I've, I've asked God to search my heart, reveal sin and failure. That does not seem to be the issue this time. I really have no worries. I think more about living and dying than ever before. I don't feel bad, but tonight what occurred to me was that the lesson for me with my heart issues is that it's not a warning to slow down and do less, but rather it's a wake-up call to put more fire in my passion, more resolve in my purpose, and greater urgency in my preaching. God is good. I'm unsure if I wasn't listening or God wasn't talking to me. I don't mean that I think God was mad at me. He was just very quiet in my heart, and I wasn't being still enough. I think that's okay. Not for me not to be still enough, but for God to be quiet. I went for a long walk on a cold, crisp morning. I was awed by God's handiwork, and I was refreshed by the solitude of the early morning. And you want to know something? Until I went back and looked at the notes, being reminded that you write things down so you don't forget them, I'd forgotten I'd written all those things. I'd forgotten, really, pretty much every one of them. Writing it down has a purpose. Three steps in the process, we'll wrap this up. He says, write it down, make it plain, and then pass it on. Write it down, make it plain. That's a kind way of saying keep it simple, silly, okay, and pass it on. God has a purpose at the right time. He is never late. He said, I've got a a specific purpose to accomplish with what's going on, and I will not be late. I show up early because I'm impatient. What he teaches us today might not be needed until a couple of tomorrows from now, and if I don't write it down, I might forget to remember. Let me close with this. One of my favorite authors of all time is Charles Swindoll. One time he found himself engaged in too many commitment in too few a days. He got nervous and he got tense about it. He said, I was snapping at my wife and cross with our kids. I was choking down my food at mealtimes and feeling irritated at those unexpected interruptions in my day. He recalled all this in his book called Stress Fractures. He said, before long, things around our home started reflecting the patter of my hurry-up style. It has become unbearable. I distinctly remember after supper one evening, the words of our youngest daughter, Colleen. She wanted to tell me about something important that happened to her at school that day, and she began hurriedly, Dad, Dad, Daddy, I want to tell you something, and I'll tell it to you really fast. Suddenly realizing her frustration, I answered her, and I said, Honey, you can tell me. And you don't have to tell me really fast. Just say it slowly. Swindoll said, I'll never forget my nine-year-old's answer. She said, then, Daddy, please listen slowly. Please listen slowly. I think God might be saying the same to you and me. We need to listen slowly. In a season of life, when it's cluttered, when it's messy, when it's chaotic. We need to withdraw from stuff. Let's take a fast from noise. We then need to wait quietly and patiently. Let's reduce the interference and breathe normally. Let's watch and listen for God's direction. Meditate on His truth and His character, not our circumstances. And then let's write it down. So we don't forget. We need to reflect and remember the lessons already learned so he can take us deeper through his truth. Let's pray. Father, these things we've talked about today do not come easily or naturally to most of us. But we have a supernatural presence in us. And that is you and the person of your Holy Spirit. 
May we learn through our study of the Scriptures to rely more on the truth and the one who is the truth in us as we live our daily life. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Go have a great afternoon today.